Well, Peter, thank you very much. It's a, a, a wonderful um, introduction, and um, I'm I'm really pleased to be here. This uh, was where my, uh, my my forefathers actually trained in agriculture in Wagga Wagga. Um, it doesn't sound like that. Uh, a, a, a plausible uh, explanation with my accent, but it was actually my grandfather's uh, brother who went to farm in South Africa after, just after the Boer War, having trained here at Wagga, and it was that family that really inspired my interest in agriculture. So it's really nice to be back, um, in a sense. <coughs> what I'm going to talk about today is just give you a brief overview of what a CRC is, um, and then go quickly through um, a number of slides that just emphasise the importance of productivity, um, just that's something we, we really need to understand in setting our direction. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about genomics as one of the underpinning technologies for the future, the importance of meat quality, wool quality, and then very briefly at the end, Peter, when I get to that point, you'll know I'm, I'm close, so you can relax. But first of all, what's a CRC? And it's really important to understand that a CRC is made up of the participants. And <coughs> I'll just stress that. In the current CRC, we've got 21 participants. And you only get a CRC going um, if you really identify a big ticket industry opportunity. Because um, it's very, very competitive. It's not uh, industry money. It is the Commonwealth money that could go to mining, IT, banking. And it's the sheep industry, in this case, that's got to put up the compelling case for the industry to fund it. So in the current CRC, which goes through till June next year, we've got Commonwealth funding of 35 million over the seven year period, and that's supported by industry's commitment with MLA, AWI, um, putting in a significant amount of cash. But have a look at the bottom line there, that's $70 million of in-kind. Now, people worry about you know, whether in-kind is the same as cash. Well, I'll tell you what it is because it's real people's salaries, it's resources, uh, research stations that are allocated um, to do this research. And so the key thing here is that you know, you've got industry collaborating to sort out some big ticket opportunities that it just couldn't on, on, you know, on the basis of any one organisation working on its own. We're right now um, in the process of uh, uh, an extension application, which, um, if all goes well, will um, have an outcome by December this year. And here we've actually got an increase in the number of participants, 35 participants right throughout the full value chain meat um, and, and the information chain. So we, on the meat side, I'll just tell you very briefly that we've gone right through to the breeders, so we've got the White Suffolks, the, the uh, Pearl Dorsets, etc. Um, and we've got processors, this is Whamco, JBS, um, and uh, Thomas Foods signed up together with um, big involvement of MLA, AMPC, the meat processors, and Woolworths and Coles have also signed up. So, you know, there you've got the full value chain that is only brought together when you've actually got a, you know, a, a, a powerful vision of uh, something that's achievable for the industry. So that's what a CRC is. Um, it's a complex beast, but they really are productive if they work well. Rightio, let's just look briefly to set the background of um, where <coughs> the industry is at the moment. No surprises here. Over the last um, 30 years or so, the terms of trade for agriculture have decreased by 39%. And they're not going to stop there. It is a relentless grinding decrease. And that's the blue line. The red, line, the, the red histograms show agricultural production. Not really changing, but terms of trade are. But have a look at this. Here is your, uh, your, your gross value of production declining without innovation. And this is the big wedge of innovation. Now, that productivity gain that you get from research and applying research is what keeps agriculture afloat. And if we stop that innovation at all levels, driving productivity gain, we've had it. Uh, you can toss it in now. There's no silver bullets coming through with big prices. I'll get on to prices and how, how we can focus on those. But unless we get productivity right, forget it. Let's look at labour 
price index. And this is a very interesting uh, study uh, that Sir Rudek report just uh, recently out and compares productivity gains in Australia, Canada and United States. But have a look at this. This is the labour costs and you can, they started a indexed at 100 in 61. They are now up around 2,000, um, so 20 times the, 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 the real cost. And this is Australia. So the labour is not only um, in increasing, it's higher than our competitors. So there are two things at play here. One is we've really got to focus on productivity, but labour productivity. And you can have a look at this graph here, which shows labour, um, it's called uh, labour input intensity, but it effectively shows a declining labour input over time per unit of productivity. <coughs> it's going down at 4.6% per annum in Australia. Okay, that's 4.6% less people involved in agriculture per unit of output. So again, it's labour efficiency that is, is changing faster than anything and it's something which we've got to focus on as we plan for the future. And here's the other bit in this labour bit. Here's the average age of um, owners and managers. We were worried when it was 53 years old. <laughs> it's now up around 60. <coughs> Luckily, uh, these sorts of ages seem younger as we grow older, but it's a very, very serious issue for the whole industry. You know, and and it's, 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 it's part of this feeling that it's not high tech, it's not profitable, it's not the place to be, and we've got to change that as well. So, there's some of the um, productivity things, and what are the implications that, uh, of, of this? Well, one of the things is that cropping, where there really have been consistent increases in productivity, you know, the size of the gear, the efficiency of cropping just goes up and up and up. It's, it's a real high tech, um, and as well as the genetics, the um, plant breeding, it's going uh, at a pace, um, and the genetically modified um, uh, breeding programs have also paid, uh, you know, contributed to that. Sheep um, is going absolutely the other direction, partly because of the fallout of the uh, reserve price scheme, but also because we haven't matched that productivity. But let's just have a look at this um, at, at the next couple of slides, showing the change that's taken place in the gross value of meat and wool. And it used to be the wool industry with these guys producing sheep meat as the real poor cousins. It's now on an equal footing, pretty well 50-50. But let's just have a quick look at where wool and sheep meat fit in the world markets, because this gives us some idea of how we should be positioning the products that we produce that make us the money from, from uh, breeding and growing sheep. First of all, sheep meat. It represents 3.2% of the meat market. We will never compete with pork, chicken on price, and we'll never compete in terms of volume with beef. So it's a niche product. On wool, it's 1.6% of the world fibre production. Again, we will never compete with cotton and man-made fibres on price. So what you can see from those two graphs is that we have got to compete as a niche product in a quality market. Okay, and that quality market is essential. So it's not just productivity, it is product quality. If you look at the real prices of wool, beef and wheat, okay, these are real prices and they just keep flatlining from 1990 to 2010. If anything, they're going down gradually. Wool, the trend line is minus four cents per kilogram clean over that time. All of these commodities at the moment are trading as commodities. Okay, even wool is more determined by the price of cotton than by anything else. People talk about the luxury market, jitters in Europe, but you just plot cotton and, and, um, and, and wool and that four to five times multiplier for, um, for wool keeps going. You have a look at the other side though, lamb and mutton. Over the last um, 20 years, Lamb has gone up at 12 cents per kilogram per year, every year. Mutton's gone with it. I mean, it's an incredible success story. Let's just have a look at that. And it's, it's quite, quite different from wool. 
So what's happened here is it wasn't always the case, and many in this room will remember how in the uh, late 1980s, the sheep meat industry was an absolute basket case. You know, it was just the, ap you know, it, it was the worst place to be in the production system. People were talking about how to make um, lamb taste like pork so that they could at least get on its coattails. Well, thank goodness we didn't go down that route. <laughs> but have a look. Around 1990, the industry got together and said, hey guys, what, is, what does the consumer really want? Well, what the consumer wanted at that stage was a larger, leaner carcass. They didn't want this little chop with a pile of fat um, as, as, as the staple. The move to larger, leaner carcasses has just gone um, from that decision point in early 1990s up, up, up. And with it has gone the price. Let's just look at one little thing that they got right early on. Um, and I think it's something we'll revisit and we'll come back to it. But there was this huge spread in eating quality and this is sheer force so you can see that um, the distribution there was that, yeah, most of uh, lamb was pretty good but there was a long tail so it was a bit of a lottery you could sometimes get a good uh, leg of lamb sometimes it was absolute rubbish and Peter you'll understand sheer force so I hope you can explain oh, it if I... <laughs> then it came in MSA and with some electrical stimulation, some product um, specification, it tidied up that distribution enormously. And suddenly we had a uniform product that people were prepared to pay serious money for. So quality really does matter. And the result is, while all of these products, this is wool, wheat, beef, have been trund trundling along, this is real prices indexed, um, no real movement, whereas you've got lamb has come over that period um, a two and a half fold increase in, 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 in price. So you get the price right, the product that the consumer wants in that niche market and people really pay for it. I mean can you imagine 20 years ago someone would say to you you go into the supermarket and you're going to pay more for a rack of lamb than for um, a, a kilo of prawns. Well go and buy a rack of lamb now you'll pay 40 bucks a kilo and you'll probably pay about $15 a kilo for your prawns if you're a cheap skate and get the imported ones. So, you know, that has turned around absolutely. And our challenge now is actually to keep lamb at that quality so that it remains at the top of the tree and doesn't become just meat. So let's look at what's happened then in a bit more detail in the lamb industry and then we'll, we'll, we'll move on. So this is the uh, kilos average carcass weight it's gone from 17 to around just over 21 kilos per carcass now that has happened because of genetics and over this 20 year period that equates to 200 grams per year every year it's around about just to get a sighter on what productivity gain means it's around about a 1.1 percent um, year on year increase in productivity that level is absolutely bread and butter achievable using the right genetics. So if you take one message home today is going to be, and we'll come back to it, get your genetics right and you will look after your productivity gain. You get stagnant genetics in the sheep game and you will go out the back door in five to ten years. Just absolute simple mathematics. And look at the am amount of money that's associated with that um, at $4 a kilo that equates to an increase per lamb of around $16 um, and that's pretty well for nothing. And you add on to that the fact that this larger carcass um, on a per head slaughter cost is worth another 20 cents um, per head per year. Okay, <coughs> sorry not um, of, of that period. Let's look at the wool side. Now if you go right back to 1860 when uh, people first started measuring and reporting on wool <coughs> and you look at the average fleece weight it's a, it's a real gross figure. It's just you know, the amount of wool we produce divided by the number of sheep and uh, so the, the, the uh, average fleece weight over time and um, we'll come back to, to, to look at the um, uh, a tail bit later on, but let's just look at two parts of this curve. 
There in the early days where they were just measuring and selecting for fleece weight, they were going up at about 1.3% per year. Um, it's highly heritable. You can really move fleece weight and fibre diameter faster than anything. They're highly heritable, easy, easy to measure. But let's look at what happens when we move up to this um, period here where we're starting to introduce fibre diameter as, a, as, as another selection parameter. Um, the uh, things become a little bit more complicated and unless we're really using best practice genetics things slump badly because you're trying to go in two directions and you're not doing either very well. We've also had this very significant drop in fleece weight um, on, a, on a flock average, uh, uh, the whole flock average, as people principally in Queensland have got out of sheep. Now those were the heavy cutter, um, sort of medium micron sheep, and they've just gone. You know, well, sheep in Queensland are pretty well a, uh, an endangered species. And uh, there, there are also other areas where they've gone um, principally for labour. I mean, the, the people talk about dogs and um, predators, but it's really the labour components that, that's done it. And this is the thing that's made the wool job a lot more difficult. This is the, the, the uh, micron premium, so this is fibre diameter at the bottom here, and I'm not sure where these question marks dis um, arrived from, but you know, this, this micron um, has moved, the micron premium has moved all over the place. In 2011, we had this glorious year where wool was wool again and finer microns were the order of the day. People start then resetting their, um, their, their um, breeding objectives, their production objectives to target the finer microns and then the next year it's back, there's the 2012 and here's the 2013. <laughs> Um, with absolutely just about flat, no micron premium at all, and this is this is I mean it's seriously hurting. It, I'm sure they're, they're, they're fine um, wool producers here, and it's a very uncomfortable place to be. Some of the economists say, oh, it's just because of supply and demand that we produce too much of this fine wool. So this is the sub 18 micron uh, curve, and you can see that from about 2003, it's actually been quite stable. So it's not not as if it's gone up dramatically, this, this ultra-fine wool, and it's, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's pretty stable. Certainly the 21, 22 and even the 19 micron, those uh, um, uh, production figures, this is uh, total wool production, greasy, have fallen quite dramatically. So our clip has changed quite dramatically from the average being around 21, 22 to the average now being really 19, 20. And with this quite significant part of um, super fine, ultra fine wool. So I'll come back to that because quite a lot of the CRC's research has focused on those ultra fine wools and how to position them appropriately in the market. But just before we move on to that specific um, component, I want to emphasize productivity gains are essential. The route to those gains is smart use of genetics and smart use of genetics is something that everybody in this room can capture right now. Okay, this is not something that's going to happen in the future, it's going to, it happens now. So start getting your mind around how you can get the most out of your genetics and as you aim for productivity also think product uh, quality and what that means. This isn't a sheep, but it does make the point that uh, over this period, chicken has been absolutely totally changed by genetics. Now we can remember that Sunday roast that uh, this little this little fella uh, used to growl over the, uh, the, the 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 bones, whereas now what you really find in the supermarkets is skinless, boneless um, thighs and 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 breasts. The breast now makes up 25% of the bird. That genetics is what we're able to capture now in the sheep industry. And I just want to divert and talk about genetics for a, a short time and some of those knowing my background um, would think this is a very dangerous little activity getting into genetics but you can relax Peter, I've learned a lot about genetics in the last while. So what I'll tell you, um, now the absolute fundamentals. 
things you will know. The first thing is genetic gain is cumulative. Okay, so if you're going along at a gain of about 70 cents per year per year, which is the average of the merino industry, over a seven year period you'll be up to making an extra $4.90 per U. If you're in the terminals and you're using some of the uh, Suffolk's, Pole Dorset, you're going along at about $2 per U, that's the average, and so that $14 figure is directly comparable with the um, seven, 70 cents um, and that's the difference that's, that's available to you. Most merinos are going along at zero um, and merinos can quite easily go along at a rate of $2.40 to $2.50 per U per year cumulative. It's a huge, huge issue um, and a huge opportunity getting this one right. Now here, I'm just going to introduce this little concept of, this is all the genetics I know so you can relax, but you do need to know this, just, just some of the fundamentals of this equation. So when I start talking about the wonder of genomics, you'll understand why it's so good. The rate of genetic gain is determined by these four factors, and I'm only going to talk about two. I mean, this accuracy, because it's actually quite a difficult one, and the generation interval. What this accuracy means is the accuracy with which you can predict the true genetic merit of an animal. Now looking at the animal tells you nothing. Okay? It might tell you if he's a big fella or a little fella, but it doesn't tell you whether he was a twin or a single. It doesn't tell you what the quality of the wool was, what his resistance to parasites might be. All of that is actually quite difficult to get an understanding of the true genetic merit of the animal. And this is where the really clever genetics comes in. And, but the, the key thing that you've got to look at here is that if we increase accuracy, we increase genetic gain because we're selecting the right animals to go into our breeding program. So that's why this accuracy is so important. The second thing is this, gen, this generation interval. If we're breeding from older rams, okay, more, more months, more years, you're dividing this lot by a bigger number and so your genetic gain is slower. So the two things here that you want to be able to do is to select animals younger to reduce your genetic interval so that that increases your rate of gain and you want to get better accuracy. Okay, these ones are common to any, any bit of genetics. And how we predict genetic merit is from the performance of the animal, its own, its own measurements, and from its pedigree. And the pedigree is very important. You know, don't, don't go and marry a, um, a, a young lady until you've actually had a good look at her family too. You know? what, and, uh, and similarly for, for young ladies, don't uh, you know, check whether the old man's bald and um, whether the whole family's got crooked teeth because you know, it's quite important. Even if you, you got the handsome one of the litter, um, the rest are going to tell you a pretty important story. The new game in town, though, is to add to these two genomic or DNA information. And this is what the new game in town is and what the CRC has spent a lot of money and a lot of time over. DNA, everyone knows, they're the building blocks of life and it's the code that determines what happens um, in growth, development, resistance to disease, etc. And there are these things here which are called SNPs. It's a, a single point of difference between two animals in the sequence of the code. Now, you can think of these as um, a, a mutation, but they're, they're non-functional mutations. They're just markers. These things, um, these, these, these SNPs or these, these points of difference occur and the magic thing is that right along this whole um, uh, um, to chain of DNA, we're able now to measure 50,000 points of difference. So you can actually sort of map what's happening and what you get from mum and from dad and what came from your uncles and aunts and things. And so that a, so a single sample of blood taken at marking or, or uh, even closer to birth if you'd like to, that sample of blood will give you that pattern of DNA. And how it's measured is just remarkable. Here's a 10 cent piece just to show you the size, not the cost. And here we've got 
12 tests. You can see these little squares here. That each of those is, is, is a test for one animal, 50,000 little wells. And that's how we get the information. They all come out as zeros and ones, and the people who look at those zeros and ones and give us the answers are pretty clever guys, but uh, not, not for me, thanks. How we use this information is actually quite simple um, in, in concept. And you would have heard about our information nucleus program. What that's involved is in, we've got lots and lots of sheep. We do lots and lots of measurements on them. So we've measured uh, reproductive performance, lamb mortality, um, worm egg counts, etc. We've measured everything we can on wool and everything we can on meat. So this gives you, on each sheep, effectively a 360 degree um, set of information on, on uh, its physical or its phenotypic parameters. At the same time, we take a sample of blood and analyze it for its DNA. And this then becomes a black box um, association analysis. So what you're doing is you're saying this pattern of DNA is associated with animals that grow faster, more worm resistant, etc. And once you get these prediction equations, you can then take from an unknown animal a sample of DNA and predict its breeding value. But just to be super clear, this is not a simple process, and it's, um, uh, this is what the information nucleus was about. No need to read every slide, but over a five-year period, we've um, worked on eight sites around Australia, 18 organisations, um, and totally we've collected about over a million bits of information. So it's, you only get these accurate predictions that we talked about here by mega amounts of data, both DNA and, and, um, and, and physical. But the really good thing is that as we've collected all this data, whether it's DNA, whether it's meat, um, as it's come down, it's come through the lamb plan, Merino Select in the sheep genetics um, warehouse, and it's, it's gone out as new information, almost real time. So this stuff isn't something that's coming in the future, it's available um, you know, right now as it happens. And it's not a silver bullet. It contributes to pedigree performance and adds in just this DNA information. So what are the benefits of this? Let's just look here um, at the accuracy, which you now know um, why it's important, with no genomic selection and with genomic selection. And this is the percent different, difference. So look right down to the bottom there. This is when you're going to select your young merinos at six months on a whole range of parameters. The improvement in accuracy is around 38%. The improvement in genetic gain is therefore 38%. It's beautiful, simple mathematics. And the important thing here is look at some of the things which we're measuring. We, we're um, able to predict worm egg counts or your resistance to parasites. And you're also predicting things like adult fleece weight um, and adult mean diameter. So these things that are only available late in the animal's life. The benefits um, become less important as the animals grow older. So this, the last one was for uh, six months, this one's for 18 months. But even there, you've started to collect a lot of data on the animal and its relatives, but you're still around 20% better off. So hugely powerful. And in the terminals, um, the benefits are um, around 16%, quite a bit less. But here you're getting um, things such as intramuscular fat. And we'll come back to that because intramuscular fat is one of the key determinants of eating quality. We've never been able to measure it in commercial breeding programs. It's always been too difficult, too expensive. We now can <coughs> predict it from the DNA and it's becoming critical in our production and marketing system. So briefly, the benefits of DNA analysis are that we're able to select younger animals with more accuracy on a broader range of traits. Gives us faster and better balanced genetic gain. Meat quality. You only know meat quality in, uh, by feeding it to people, and this is exactly what we're reporting here. So each dot here is a set of samples around from about six animals from a single sire. So these are progeny groups and they've been tested by consumers, the loin um, and the top side. 
the loins are pretty tender muscle, the top side's quite tough. And here you can see the percent um, acceptance. These ones round 40 to 50, these ones going up to 70. I'll tell you a secret, this ram here, the lowest quality eating um, by consumers is the top, I was going to say the breed, I won't say the breed, but the, one of the top semen size for growth, muscling and fat. And he's the toughest ram in there. He's shot now, he's dead, so I don't need to worry. <laughs> but until that moment when we actually started looking at progeny eating quality, we hadn't a clue. And this is one of the sad facts that as you select for faster growth, leaner, bigger muscling, they get tougher and tougher. And soon you're producing pork, not lamb. The other good news, and uh, I'll get shot if I tell you this, but I will anyway, these ones are your merinos. The merinos have been slammed for rubbish quality, and look at these beautiful big terminals and things. It's actually the merino that's underpinned the quality in our lamb eating um, standards. So that's, uh, that's, that's something, and this, this intramuscular fat and eating quality is going to become absolutely standard. Now why is it so important? And here we come to some real dollars. You've heard of the MSA um, system of grading, where two stars unsatisfactory, three is good every day, four is better than average, and five is premium. But what does that mean? In a lot of studies with consumers, if, you, if they say they're prepared to pay $10 um, for three star um, meat, they'll pay one and a half times that for four, twice that for five, and only half of that for ungraded two star. So it's real money for the consumer. Let's put those um, discriminators in for that last graph I showed you. And you see this guy, this is a loin and it's dog meat. Whereas here, we've got loins that are five star, you know, you'd present them in any restaurant with pride. And on the um, top side, again here, there's the two, that's the ungraded, and three, you can see that it's, the, you know, being able to push that up and down is big money for the whole industry. Briefly now the wool story. When people started wearing lightweight knitwear next to the skin it was a revolution for the wool industry. Icebreaker has been the, the, the classic product um, but there's also snow gum, there are a pile of others, Katmandu, etc. When they got into this next to skin lightweight they broke the myth that it was itchy bulky and we've created a new generation of consumers willing to pay premium prices for these high grade next to skin um, products but it's still got that challenge that every now and then quite often actually you get an itchy scratchy um, woolen garment and when you do that it's the last one you buy for a very long time and so consumers, understandably, have got mixed feelings about buying um, and wearing wool next to the skin. This inconsistent uh, quality is a huge risk for the whole supply chain. And it's estimated that around 30% of woolen garments are returned um, from retailer down to the supplier. They then discounted, they sold at half price, quarter price, out they go. And who's been the loser? The whole supply chain everyone. So being able to predict and measure the comfort and also the handle have been two really important things and we took these challenges on in the CRC. I thought we were really stupid when we did that because I thought they're going to be too difficult. But I'm really pleased that we've had a breakthrough in objective measurement on this ability to measure these lightweight uh, knitted fabrics. And what we've got here is an ability with next generation next to skin wool of ensuring that the retailers, the knitters, the garment manufacturers have that confidence in the product that they're working with all the way through. And that by getting certainty in the supply chain is really set to drive demand for Australian wool, particularly in these ultra fine and uh, super fine categories. The supply chain is now able to differentiate products based on quality. Until now it's been colour and the feel. And everyone who's had a bad experience with wool knows that they've felt a garment and it's been beautifully soft. 
and they've taken it home and that softness came from a bit of silicon finish and it's prickly and it's itchy and that $30 wool um, singlet you got from Target it's going to really hurt. So this transparency of um, trading through the supply chain, the consistency of the product is a real, real breakthrough. And I'll just tell you briefly about these uh, systems. In order to measure comfort, we went again to the consumer. And each of these lines represents uh, between 25 and, f and, and uh, 35 young ladies. We found that blokes were just hopeless at this. They couldn't tell something that was prickly from something which was just beautiful. So these were women between the age of um, 25 and 35, all knowing a lot about um, uh, clothes, prepared to spend serious money on them. And the higher the value here is the higher the prickle score. So these ones here was terribly uncomfortable, particularly as they went through the trial from air conditioned comfort to a hot room to a hot room with exercise and then cooling down afterwards. And you can see that where these garments become very uncomfortable is when you start perspiring. When you start perspiring, your skin softens and that's when the little um, prickles get you. So very, very expensive, very accurate. Um, in, in predicting the difference between um, uh, fabrics. And we've done 58 of those and would have spent nearly $3 million on that exercise. Too expensive. So what's the alternative? Is to measure it with the machine. And when the guy said they were going to develop this wool comfort meter, we, a lot of people um, were quite surprised. They said, that'll be terrific. Uh, just give us a call when you've got it. Well, we've got it. It's on the market and I'll tell you about it. What it is, this head, um, here moves backwards and forwards across the fabric and what happens there there's a wire that um, moves across just above the surface of the fabric and um, as it, as it uh, encounters stiff fibers that would stick into you it counts them and so what we're able to do now is to calibrate the instrument measurement against the wearer scores and we're able to say right in this zone below 300 um, on, the, on, on the instrument, we will have a set of products guaranteed, absolutely guaranteed to be comfortable. And uh, this is um, an area where there's a little bit of variability. Sometimes they're comfortable, sometimes they're not. Um, and it's, it's a bit more variable here in country where you can't you know, actually wear the garment for more than about five minutes. But this is the sub 18 micron zone. I mean this, and the finer the micron, the better the fabric gets. And uh, I mean, there are lots of things that you can do in the spinning and the knitting and things. That, there's a pile of variables. But it is an uh, ultra fine, super fine game. Handle. Now, how difficult is this? You know, to get objective measurement of how a fabric feels. Well, the guys wanted to know um, is it rough, smooth, soft, hard, all these things. And we said, well, that's a great, great uh, idea. Let's do it. And it's a very simple process that's used here. It's the same as pulling a silk scarf through a, a, a ring. You know that test, the more easily it slips through, the better the quality of the silk. Well, it's exactly the same here. We clamp a bit of fabric between uh, two plates and then you push it down through this nozzle. And as you do, the fabric uh, deforms and it forms all kinds of shape. And as it disappears down, um, you, you get a simple curve. Um, of the um, displacement or the distance it goes through and the force. And so that blue line is the shape of the curve and then by analysing it every which way, each of the parameters, um, for example, the, the, the bottom bit here is, is the stretch and then there's the, um, the, the factors that um, sort of crinkle and deform. And we're able then to use these two tests, the comfort and the handle to differentiate wool in a positive way. And I'll just go quickly through this slide. So this is the prickle sensation, 16 micron, um, very, very low, and wearers love it. They like it. 81% say this is terrific. And it's got a low comfort meter and a pretty um, high, this, this score here is out of 10, the higher the better for, for handle. So these are the two objective measurements. This is what the consumers say. And this is what the prickle meter is. So what you can see here is you go up to 18 to 20 micron, suddenly you've got prickly wool and look at that. Your consumer says, 
don't like it. Not all of them, but your average consumer says they don't like it. But have a look at cotton. This is cotton at the bottom. We will never beat cotton for being really comfortable next to the skin. It's 12 micron. It's just smooth as. But look at this. The, um, it, it's only 70% compared to 80 like it. People love the feel of wool. They love that, uh, that, that, that luxurious feel. And it, the two tests together, the comfort and the handle, give you that positive differentiation that really explains what the consumer is prepared to pay for. And these two tests, the handle um, and, and, and the comfort, are now uh, being trialled in Australia through AWTA in Melbourne and we've also got testing going on in China and a couple of the major knitters um, giving us some um, pretty good feedback on, on its use. So Peter, just these final two and, and um, we're, we're, we're done. Um, just before finishing, wanted to point out that other aspects of the CRC um, were to work on well-adapted sheep, making management easier. And there have been a, a, a number of training programs, the Bread Well, Fed Well, you might have um, be familiar with. There's a ram breeding guide, which um, we're working on. And there's a set of publications, which are really quite handy, um, called Sheep, the Simple Guide, Making More Money from Less Labour. Um, and that's, that's available. If you like copies of it, you visit our website and we can send you one. We've similarly put a lot of effort into improving reproductive um, efficiency and um, we take credit for setting up the Lifetime U Management Program um, and also the Managed Scanned U Workshop which uh, Chris Shands ran so, so effectively. And the parasite management, um, I'll be careful what I say about parasites in this group, but you know, the online information systems that are created through Flyboss, Worm Boss and the new Lice Boss is going to be launched next week, next Tuesday, it'll be live. Um, they are pro you know, proving to be extremely good resources for um, better management of, of, of parasites. And this extension um, <coughs> will again take us further. The concept is that we will build on this uh, technological transformation that's occurring in the sheep industry. We'll build on it by um, managing welfare, well-being in a more proactive way, um, capitalising on this meat value chain that we've established and underpinning both of these by going to the next level of genomic uh, technologies for faster and affordable genetic gain. So thanks Peter. I think okay, I've done my uh, time. Look, not bad for a card carrying nutritionist, James. You've, uh, you've extended widely there. Excellent. <laughs> um, now, we have a, a discussion session, a panel session at the end, but uh, we do have a couple of minutes if you have uh, points of clarification or uh, a burning question you might like to ask. We have a couple of minutes for that. So, the floor is yours, guys and girls. Yeah. I'm concerned about. Uh, the longevity of the sheep CRC. How confident are you um, of this extension? We're confident, but it's just terribly competitive. And I mean, I, I, I agree that um, in agriculture, and I'll just have a two, two second plug here, Peter. I mean, in agriculture, we don't solve problems in three years. We also don't solve problems in single projects. You know, we only really change our understanding of this complex system and get it implemented by taking a consolidated approach over a period of seven to ten years. Um, that's just the reality and there's got to be, I think, a mechanism where we do it, with or without a CRC. Yes? Um, yeah, I just uh, sitting here uh, do you do any work in the, in the clean sheep area? I mean, you, you seem to be focused on merinos, which has been a bit of a downhill slide for many, many years. Yeah. And uh, it seems the clean sheep industry, where we don't have anything to do with wool at all, raises our productivity quite extensively. I know quite a number of merino breeders who never go back to uh, buy strike and all that sort of stuff. And, sure. Uh, 
Um, we've done in this program a bit of work on the DORPA in terms of meat quality. As I explained, the genomics area, which we've really focused a lot of effort on, is a numbers game, and it's you, we only have the resources, quite you know, very sadly, to focus on the major breeds, and we we don't have predictions, unlikely to have predictions for um, the, the the shedding breeds. Um, in the foreseeable future. When we get onto full sequencing, it might happen, but uh, at, at, at the moment, no. Well, that's where we see the future. The, the, uh, we've kicked around with Merinos for 200 years or more, and uh, the Dorpers have come in, from, come in from South Australia, but we have had a lot of clean sheep, South Africa, sorry. We ha have had a lot of clean, yeah. wool, uh, clean sheep in Australia for some years, and the biggest problem with us, of course, is getting a decent price at the uh, Sadio. Sure. No, I mean, there are different views on this, and I mean, uh, they have their place absolutely without question. But there's, it's also pretty handy having a ewe that produces wool every day she's around. It, um, particularly if it's, if, you know, you, and there's really no reason why we can't breed um, the wrinkles out of them, get the, get, get the fly traps out, and um, also breed for worm resistance. I mean, there's huge progress in there. Let's explore that one more yeah. in our you know, other session. But just a quick last look at this following on from that. I was just wondering if you could tell me what breed that took like. Oh, that's a merino. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got a few challenging points on that one there, James. So thanks very much for that. Uh, and we'll come back to further sessions.